you, well, you kept yours, at least, <laughs> you know? I'm, I've got the fashionable John Quincy Adams look. <laughs> Hello, my name is Christina Osmeyer, and I'm a member of the Dole Institute of Politics Student Advisory Board. Welcome to the Dole Institute of Politics, and thank you for attending tonight's presentation. The Dole Student Advisory Board is composed of KU students committed to the work of the Dole Institute. We attend regular meetings, assist in events like this one, and plan SAB-sponsored program every semester. Members of the SAB receive great opportunities to network with our special guests. If you're a student and would like to join, please contact the Dole Institute. The Dole Institute would like to hear from you. If you enjoy tonight's program, please let us know by contacting us on Facebook, Twitter, or through our website email. Your attendance and feedback help shape our future programs. Before we begin tonight, I'd like to remind you to please turn off your cell phones. After the interview, we will have some time for audience questions and answers. If you have a question, please raise your hand and a student helper with a microphone will come to you. Please ask just one brief question. And now, please welcome Barbara Ballard. Good evening. Let's have a nice round of applause for our students. Thank you. Well, again, this evening, welcome. And we are delighted. As Richard said, he's always surprised to see so many people here, and we're not surprised. And I think part of it is if you, if you give a smashing one on George Washington, two on John Adams, they expect no less on uh, Thomas Jefferson. And I think you all know what Richard Norton Smith can do. Before I start with just a little bit of an introduction, I do want to just brief you on what's on our back again for our programs. And again, we want you, if you can, to make our study groups with uh, Doe Fellow, Brigadier General Roosevelt Barfield. And it's the US Engagement, Political, uh, Military Affairs. And he started his program on the 13th, so uh, Wednesdays from 4 to 5.30. If you've not come, if you come once, I can almost guarantee you'll come again if you can fit it in your schedule. Again, we have the Kansas new tax policy, boon or bust, and that will be next Sunday, February the 24th at 4 p.m., and that will be between State Senator Tom Holland and Kansas Secretary of Revenue Nick Jordan. Nick Jordan is a former uh, senator, so that will be a lively program as well. And leadership and globalization in the sports series, reinventing the empire with sporting uh, Kansas City CEO, co-owner Rob Heineman, and that's March the 5th. And again, our Fort Leavenworth series, At Home and Abroad, Selected Topics on World War II, War on the Atlantic, Not Battle of Misconceptions and Clarifications. And I think you will find that interesting uh, as well. For our third program, and again, you know what our title is, In the Beginning, Three Men Who Made America with Richard Norton Smith. And I was looking over some of his notes and what he had to say on his first and second. And with George Washington, I asked him, did he have any children? And he said, no, none. He was father of our country. Oh. And so when we look at that, but interesting thing about it, he was married to Martha. Now, John Adams, well, and George Washington was born February 22nd, 1732. And he was born in Westmoreland County, Virginia. John Adams was actually born in 1735, and he was born in Massachusetts Bay, and his wife was named Abigail. And Thomas Jefferson's wife was named Martha as well, and uh, he was born in 1743 in Almeria County, Virginia. So you look at this in terms of President 1, President 2, and now we're going to President 3. I mentioned it to someone today in the Capitol, and they kind of smiled, and they said, well, Adams was like the middle child. And if you remember what we heard last week of how he had to come after the first president and all the things that happened, in many ways that were the case, except he made an identity for himself out of that, which normally sometimes they get lost in the shuffle. And Thomas Jefferson, you will hear more about him today. No exception, historian, biographer, will keep you on the edge of your seat, will give you more information than you thought you ever knew about 
any of these presidents, and Jefferson will be no exception, will be humorous, very serious in that history is serious, but it's not boring, it's exciting, and he brings it to life. So I couldn't wait to hear today what he was going to say about Thomas Jefferson, because I'm sure we'll leave here realizing there's some things we did not know about Thomas Jefferson, and I think that's why we come to hear Richard Norton Smith, because otherwise you could read it in a book, and you could see it in some documentary, but you can't get it live the way he presents it. So with that, I turn it over to Bill Lacey, our director here, Richard Norton Smith. Give him a round of applause, please. Thank you, uh, Barbara. Richard, I think the last time we had cold temperatures like this was two years ago when we did uh, your program on Woodrow Wilson in a blizzard. How many of you, there were a few people, hearty souls here that night. How many people were here for the Woodrow Wilson in the blizzard? We, See there? So. I also would be a cold day in Kansas when Woodrow Wilson packed the Dole Institute. <laughs> uh, <laughs> by the way, Barbara's uh, comment was well taken. I, I was a middle child. So I, I can appreciate uh, John Adams' role. Okay. Last week you introduced us to the two-party system and polarization. Uh, what role did the two-party system play in the 1800 election? Well, profound. First of all, no one really wanted to admit there was <laughs> you know, a, a two-party system. But of course, beginning with Jefferson, um, who professed uh, a loathing of partisan politics, even as behind the scenes he was pulling wires, paying off newspaper editors, uh, sometimes to uh, uh, print scurrilous material about his former friend, John Adams. Um, uh, Adams, on the other hand, genuinely was a man without a party, in a sense. The, the Federalists nominally supported him, but they were riven by factions. Alexander Hamilton despised Adams. So Jefferson had the advantage going into that campaign of actually a, a recognizable to modern eyes, uh, well-organized, disciplined, um, distinct, ideologically driven political force that existed at multiple levels. It existed in Congress, uh, it existed in the states, and uh, it certainly existed nationally in the in the presidential race, and in fact, in some ways, the presidential race uh, furthered the business of developing and defining the two parties. The uh, Adams, of course, would be the last Federalist president. Right. The the party really mm -hmm. fell on hard times. It had a brief revival during the War of eighteen twelve uh, in New England um, under somewhat dubious. Yeah. Um, circumstances, there were many Federalists who not only opposed the war with Britain, but who were actually willing to entertain the idea of seceding from the Union. Mm -hmm. uh, very interesting uh, uh, piece in realclearpolitics.com uh, today about a professor at Williams College, a history professor named Patrick Spiro, who is allowing his students to mock up would-be campaign ads from those early campaigns in lieu of doing yeah. tests and exam. And I, I wanted to show a couple of them tonight, but they're, the, the print in them are so small um, that uh, you wouldn't be able to see them on the screen. But you might want to go to that website and check it out or email me if you can't have any luck finding it. But they use quotes from various newspapers, ministers, stuff like that. Oh, Jefferson yeah. was called an atheist, an oh, sure. infidel. He was the infidel. How bitter, how bitter was that it campaign? Was, it was. Some people think it's the dirtiest campaign in American history. It was certainly the dirtiest to that point. Um, Jefferson was denounced as an infidel, um, a macaroni importing Francophile. Um, I mean, can you imagine? <laughs> Uh, forget French fries. Um, this, this was a man who had said that France is every civilized man's second home um, and um, ad adored French cuisine and was willing to go deeply in debt 
to indulge his, his appetites. The very same man who is presented as the face of democratic, small government, um, the champion of the, of the underdog. Um, Adams was accused, and, and this is just beyond belief. I mean, picture John Adams, uh, who was, you know, he's not going to win People Magazine's Sexiest Man Alive <laughs> contest uh, any time in our lifetime. Um, but he was actually criticized. He was, it was alleged that he had um, brought a quartet of prostitutes imported from Europe. Jefferson brought macaroni, and John Adams allegedly brought other delights, um, two for himself and two for George Washington. And um, Adams, whose sense of humor was unreliable uh, at best, in this instance saw the humor and lamented the fact that General Washington you know, took all, two of the four and only left him with two. It, it, was, it was a campaign, in some ways it would be recognizable today, in the sense that people frittered away a vast amount of time and resources and intellectual energy on superfluous issues, on character assassination. Um, and they avoided dealing with difficult, intellectually naughty uh, issues. Okay. What qualities did Jefferson bring to the presidency? Jefferson is, I, I remember something Joseph Ellis said, that if, if Jefferson, who, who wrote a, a, a fine book on Jefferson's incredibly subtle, contradictory, some people think hypocritical character, he said that if, if Jefferson, he's the most elusive of all the founders, perhaps of all the presidents. Um, if he were a painting, he'd be the Mona Lisa. If he were a monument, he'd be the Sphinx. Henry Adams, the grandson and great-grandson of presidents who didn't much care for Jefferson's politics, said that with all the other founders, an artist could sketch it in very easily, you know, with a few broad strokes. But with Jefferson, and Jefferson alone, you would need um, the finest of pencils and the subtlest of shadings. And even then, it would, be a, it would be subject to varying interpretation depending upon what you brought to it. That's a long-winded way of saying that this was a man who combined opposites with extraordinary unthinking ease. Um, he certainly thought of himself and presented himself, as I say, as a great champion of the dispossessed, uh, of the, uh, the average man, the working man. Um, but he certainly didn't live that life himself. His attitude towards slavery, of course, is, is one that continues to excite debate and, and anger. Um, it's, I think it's, it's, it's not easy to explain, but it's easier to explain if you just trace it chronologically. As a young man, Jefferson was um, more politically radical and willing to challenge the, the, the status quo, including on the subject of slavery. As a member of the Virginia House of Burgesses, for example, he had legislation that he was prepared to introduce that would allow slaveholders to voluntarily free their slaves. And it became very clear that it would go nowhere and it would not serve his interests or the cause uh, for him to do so. Later in life, of course, you know, he spoke, he, he famously said of slavery, um, we have a wolf by the ears. And in a strange way, and I want to be very careful how I phrase this, I'm not really equating for a moment the horror of slavery with um, the philosophical bondage but the fact of the matter is that Jefferson and his class were themselves imprisoned um, by this economic system that many of them understood viscerally, emotionally, morally was wrong. And certainly was at variance with what the country professed to be all about. 
but they literally did not know how they could do away with it and still have the house on the hill, the wine in the cellar, the books in the library. Um, you know, it's, it's a, in some ways, that's one more reason why Jefferson is us. Jefferson, in so many ways, in, in encompasses the diversity, the variety, the contradictions, and the aspirations of, of America. It's one reason why I think, you know, we build memorials to Jefferson. We quote Jefferson on the 4th of July, and, and I hope we always will, but it's, it's Hamilton's world that we inhabit. Mm -hmm. Now, Jefferson, when, when, and you spoke last week about Adams kind of building, being the father of the, the, the modern uh, Navy. And yeah, Jefferson, Jefferson's the one who scuttled Jefferson, the modern Navy. Yeah, opposed it, but he wasn't at all reluctant to deploy well, him in the first Barbary and this, War. Again, remember, this is, this is a class, I'm glad you mentioned that, because the serious, really profound contradictions in Jefferson's character go to the essence of, of what kind of president he was, what kind of leader he was. He sincerely believed, uh, certainly, that the best government was the least government. He was the strictest of constructionists. When the Alien and Sedition Acts were passed, he secretly wrote uh, a resolution, Virginia or Kentucky, Madison wrote the other. But Jefferson and Madison wrote resolutions for each state to adopt that would proclaim basically that every state could nullify any federal rule, any law that they found to be objectionable. Well, you can imagine the long-term consequences of that for the Union. And that goes to the heart of just how strict Jefferson was. And yet, and economy. You know, when Jefferson became president, um, the federal budget the national debt was $111 million. The, the, the annual budget, Jeff, the way Jefferson wanted, it's about a $9 million annual budget, of which $2 million was spent on government operations, and $7 million went to retire the debt. That was Jefferson's idea of how government should operate. He closed down American legations abroad. He, uh, you know, took a knife certainly to military expenditures. It had, remember, it had always been a Republican small r belief amounting to um, religious certitude that standing armies posed a threat to the liberties of those they were supposed to protect. They also posed a threat to the economic stability, and certainly they posed a threat to Jefferson's plan to pay off the deficit, and that extended to the Navy. Um, Jefferson basically scuttled the, the frigates, most of the ships that Adams had commissioned. And yet, your point is well taken, this is the president who reversed the passivity under Washington, under George Washington, the United States, the item in the budget every year, bribes to the Barbary pirates. Um, that was the price necessarily we paid to stay out of war uh, because getting into a war would be worse than paying the uh, bribe. It was Jefferson, the non-militarist, the economizer, who basically on his own in a display of executive authority that Washington I think would have shied away from, uh, took on the Barbary pirates. Um, he, cre he didn't have frigates, so um, they, they had these little gunboats, which were called Jeffs. Um, and they were enough to defeat the Barbary pirates. And of course, in the, in the uh, process, it gave us the immortal line uh, about uh, to the shores of Tripoli. Uh, where do you think it comes from? Um, in the Marine, the Marine song. Um, it was also Jefferson, the non-militarist, who, com who commissions the United States Military Academy at West Point. 
1802. Go figure. I mean, this man who is basically scuttling the physical defenses of the nation, and it will really come back to haunt him in his second term, and of course his successor even more, uh, nevertheless is laying down uh, this groundwork to professionalize and to some degree nationalize uh, an army that doesn't really exist. In 1803, he uh, made the Louisiana Purchase from France, purchased all that land for three cents an acre. Three cents how an acre. How Double important was that to the country and to his presidency? Well, it's, 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 it's how you get up on Mount Rushmore. You know, I mean, basically, because there were enough other problems with this, particularly the second term. But um, when you double the country for $15 million. Now remember, and Jefferson was torn. He was torn every which way. He was torn philosophically. Uh, he wanted, actually, he, he couldn't remember. This is the man who told George Washington, you can't have a national bank because there's no mention of a bank in the Constitution. Well, there's certainly nothing in the Constitution about how the president on his own can buy, you know, 828,000 square miles from Napoleon. Um, and so Jefferson was torn. Philosophically, it went against everything he ever believed. He toyed with the idea of submitting a constitutional amendment, but Napoleon wasn't going to wait for that process. And in fact, Napoleon leaked the information that if Jefferson and his negotiators didn't uh, speed things up, then he would sell it to the English. Um, and that apparently did the trick. Now, Jefferson then said, privately, I stretched the Constitution so far that it cracked. He understood exactly how far he was going. Um, the, the philosopher Jefferson would not have done what the politician and the nationalist and the explorer. You know, Jefferson had, Jefferson never set foot west of the Blue Ridge that you can see from the backyard of Monticello. Um, but it allured him all his life. It's wonderful. He, he had, in his library, he had all sorts of books that purported to describe this mythical land. And he believed, among other things, that there were um, mile-high mountains of salt, and, and the country was populated by Welsh-speaking Indians. <laughs> I don't know where the Welsh, you know, came in. Um, but, but it was to check out all of that and to examine the, the future of America that he sent Lewis and Clark Again, this is a man who had a very shrewd grasp of political packaging. Um, the, uh, the final deal on the Louisiana Purchase is announced on the 4th of July. Don't think that's, you know, by, by accident. Um, very shortly thereafter, basically he lied to Congress. Um, they got $2,500 out of Congress to fund the Lewis and Clark expedition, including $696 for Indian gifts. But it was sold to Congress not as a scientific expedition, but as a literary one. Maybe he was going to talk to those Welsh uh, Indians or something. I don't know, whatever it was. But anyway, it was all done in secret. This, again, this is a man you know, who, who personifies openness in American politics. So uh, the man who believes that Washington overexerted executive power, even in proclaiming neutrality, has taken it on himself to double the size of the United States, to, to send a military force of sorts to engage with Tripoli pirates, uh, to dispatch Lewis and Clark I mean, if Hamilton had suggested these things, you know. So it's, 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 it's those contradictions, really, that go. And, and, and we're not even, you know, the, the biggest one, of course, is uh, 
you know, this man who believes that the least government is the best government, once, of course, the Napoleonic Wars are raging, and um, Jefferson decides that it's in the interest of the United States to stay out. Um, and he comes up with this harebrained, in retrospect, scheme for an economic embargo, which presupposes that American trade is vastly more significant to the French and the British than it really is. And of course, all he does, he winds up destroying the economy of New England and every other sort of um, sea-based. He creates a secessionist movement in New England. And then, of course, Yankees being Yankees, they'll always find a way around the wall. And so um, smuggling becomes a, a lucrative and widely practiced art. And then Jefferson, the, the great friend of limited government, puts that government on the trails of the smugglers. I mean, the outreach, the intrusiveness, um, the sheer um, invasiveness of Jefferson's government is totally at odds with what Jefferson himself purports to believe. Now, on the other side of that, symbolism matters. Jefferson talked about 1800 as the revolution of 1800. Um, and there were, revol the, well, revolution is a relative term. Um, certainly, if you were the British minister calling at the White House for dinner with the president, and you found the president in his um, slippers and robe answering the door himself <laughs> and not giving precedence to your well-traveled wife going into the dining room and not giving protocol the slightest um, uh, bit of attention he, he, we all eat what he called pell-mell. Basically, everyone seated themselves, whoever got there first, seated around the table. That's how Jefferson dined at the boarding house he'd lived in at Washington. On, on his inauguration day, symbolism. Um, those of you who remember Jimmy Carter's famous walk down Pennsylvania Avenue, it had a very distinguished precedent. Uh, in 1800, Thomas Jefferson, on his inauguration day, leaves Conrad and McMunn's boarding house, where he was always to be found at the bottom of the table, and walked uh, by himself 200 yards over to the Capitol. No horses, no carriages, no bands. Um, he was making the contrast between this new Republican with a small r, Democratic with a small d, government and the um, British pomp and circumstance that he associated with his predecessors. Um, he didn't stop there. Um, as I say, he's the first president to shake hands. That was something that neither Washington nor Adams submitted to, not because they weren't perfectly personable, uh, but because they hadn't developed a sense of national identity apart from their royal antecedents. Jefferson broke with that. Um, there are all these wonderful stories of, of Jefferson's informality, stylistically, uh, his economy. He did not pay off the national debt in part because he bought Louisiana. But most people, particularly I suppose, if you live west of the Mississippi, would say he made the right choice. Okay. Um, another contradiction that I wanted you to, to talk a little bit about tonight, Richard, he opposed the Alien and Sedition Act, but then he used that against political enemies. Well, the yeah. Um, the, the, the Alien and Sedition Acts, uh, the, those of you who weren't here last week, were passed during the Adams administration, during the war scare, basically empowered the government First of all, the president personally to deport aliens who were regarded as 
dangerous. And, and secondly, the Sedition Act, as its name suggests, um, resulted in at least a dozen journalists and members of Congress going to jail for the crime of criticizing the government and its uh, foreign policies in particular. So I um, need to say this is um, the exact opposite of what Jefferson believes. Now, when he became president, he first of all, he pardoned everyone who was still in jail, um, wrote to them personally, made it very clear that he was uh, in effect apologizing on behalf of, of a nation that had lost its head. And yet, uh, when it came to uh, avenging himself against political and judicial enemies, he, um, he went far beyond anything that John Adams did. First of all, his own vice president, who was a truly evil, corrupt, amoral figure. Um, and um, he had tried to job Jefferson out of the presidency when, through a fluke in the Constitution, they each got the same number of electoral votes. So the election went to the House. And on the 36th ballot, Jefferson prevailed. You can imagine, that didn't make for warm relations between uh, the president and his vice president. Um, and Aaron Burr eventually, and then of course Burr, Jefferson probably was grateful to Burr for shooting Alexander Hamilton. But um, <laughs> aside from that, Burr obviously faded away into the political woodwork. But when next, you know, we run into him, he is in effect, and this is still being debated to this day, but he is agitating um, to separate the trans-Mississippi, Spanish-held uh, lands, some of them in, in Louisiana, um, and to create his own independent Southwest Republic. Um, anyway, it's, it's, a, it's a complicated plot, but it comes to Jefferson's attention. Burr is arrested. Jefferson wants him tried for treason. Um, not only that, you mentioned the Sedition Act. Jefferson, remember what John Adams did with the famous Midnight Judges? Um, his last act as president was to appoint a slew of Federalist <laughs> judges, uh, the most prominent being John Marshall, the great Chief Justice, who was also Jefferson's cousin and, and one of the people uh, on this planet whom he most thoroughly detested. Um, and it was mutual. Um, and uh, Marshall won most of their, most of their judicial battles. Um, one of them, in fact, being Burr's trial for treason. Marshall, the Federalist, the loose interpreter of the Constitution, on this occasion chose to define treason as narrowly as possible. Uh, and Burr was, uh, was acquitted. Um, but in addition to that, Jefferson thought it was fundamentally unfair for him with a popular mandate to be saddled with these last minute, quasi-legitimate judicial appointments by his Federalist rival. Um, in addition to that, the, the judiciary was dominated by the Federalists. It was their last redoubt. Uh, Jefferson's party had the presidency, they had Congress, uh, the Federalists clung to the judiciary. Um, and so Justice Chase of the Supreme Court, there's only been one impeachment effort in American history of a Supreme Court justice. His name was Samuel Chase, he was from Maryland, and it's a measure of how badly it went, and in some ways how it blew up in Jefferson's face, that no one has ever tried it since. Uh, Chase was accused of uh, blatant political uh, partisanship and insanity. Um, and he was probably guilty of both. <laughs> but in the, in the climate of 1803, 1804, being guilty wasn't enough to, you know, get you tossed off the court. Why that matters? Jump ahead 140 years. 
Franklin Roosevelt having swept all but two states against this state's distinguished governor, Alf Landon, um, riding high at the very peak of his popularity, um, can easily convince himself that the, the people will follow him wherever he goes. And certainly they will follow him to reform, quote unquote, the Supreme Court, which keeps you know, knocking down pillars of the New Deal. Um, and it turned out in 1937, for all of his popularity, no more than in 1803, for all of Jefferson's popularity, he was virtually unopposed for re-election, the American people have a reverence for the judiciary. They may not like individual decisions. They may take exception to, you know, one or more justices. But if, if they think a politician is trying to get his hands on or control or even dominate the courts, uh, they don't like it. And it's interesting, Jefferson went out of fashion for a long time after the Civil War. Historians tended to associate him with the South and slavery and, 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 uh, and all that. And it was FDR who brought Jefferson, not out of obscurity, he would never be obscure, but it was FDR, FDR who commissioned the Jefferson Memorial uh, on the Tidal Basin. FDR who <laughs> quoted Jefferson uh, and who, who took Jefferson, this state's rights, small government, Democrat, and transformed him into a democratic, you know, the father of the modern Democratic Party. Uh, and I've also thought it's, it's ironic that FDR may have learned the wrong lesson from his admiration of Jefferson. But in the end, he was taught uh, a painful lesson. Jefferson uh, had an incredible uh, collection of books and was an avid reader and was always striving to learn. Talk I, a little bit about that. Yeah, yeah, I cannot live without books, he said. And of course, you know, he was also a man who lived beyond his means all his life. Uh, and that included books. Um, at one point, of course, toward the end of his life, um, he really was in danger of losing Monticello which is the house that he never quite completed. You know, he kept building it and tearing it down and building it and tearing it down, which tells you something about the restlessness of this perfectionist who never quite attained his idea of perfection. But books, um, he was, to modern eyes, he would be thought a, um, almost a dinosaur in his attitude, for example, toward women as political equals. Um, he at one point told Madison that, you know, the idea of women in politics was, or, or in the administration was, was not one that he could entertain. On the other hand, his own daughters, there's wonderful letters in which Jefferson, who was the most um, hardworking, you know, from, a, from an early age, up at dawn and working all day, much of it intellectual labor. And there's this wonderful letters in which he is advising his daughter, Martha, um, about how she should spend her time and breaking down every day, you know, by half hour increment, uh, you know, and, and you should study this, that, and this, that, and this, that, and, and so on, so on. And he concludes because for all that he doesn't, his imagination has not yet reached the point where he can see women as political equals. On the other hand, he adored women um, and he had great respect for women in what he saw as their sphere. But in the end, you know, Jefferson the mathematician, everything came down to numbers. And he writes to Martha, he calculates she should pursue this university, if you will, um, in his books, um, because he calculates the odds at one in 14 that she'll marry what he calls a blockhead. <laughs> and Jefferson, whose signal fault, to, to my way of thinking, 
is that he doesn't have much sense of humor, um, can, can, can sometimes surprise you. Of course, his profligacy eventually um, caught up with him. Um, but then, of course, following the, uh, the War of 1812, when the British burned Washington, uh, they destroyed the Library of Congress. And it's, it's a remarkable thing when you start to think about it. Congress replaced the Library of Congress by buying all of Thomas Jefferson's books. Um, and uh, so they packed them up uh, in current after current after current, went down the little mountain and um, off to uh, Washington, D.C. And of course, before the first batch reached uh, the new library, uh, Jefferson was already buying new books, um, batches of them. And he said, I, I cannot live without books. The, the, the flip side of that, and I would argue the, in some ways, one more factor to take into consideration when you're trying to understand Jefferson is that he is, in a way, a man who lived in his books. Um, and that's a very useful thing in a place like this. Um, but Woodrow Wilson was, uh, uh, you know, uh, our only PhD president, president of Princeton University, uh, a great educator, a man who wrote any number of books, uh, very erudite, and yet there was a restlessness in Wilson that didn't want to confine himself to academic theory and historical example. He wanted to make history. He, he wanted to be the subject of theory. And I think part of Jefferson's otherworldliness, part of his distance from the way, I mean, some of the, some of the, um, the, the complexities and contradictions about Jefferson uh, stem from the fact that so much of his emotional life, as well as intellectual life, was defined and I think limited to the written word. Um, it's, it's one reason why the last word will never be written about Jefferson. Every generation needs to rediscover him because he put in immortal words what we as Americans like to believe sets us apart from everyone else in the world. Um, the fact that he didn't live up to those words makes him more like us maybe than anything else. But the gulf, the, gulf, the gap between what he, what he professed, what he advocated, what he asserted, and, and what he lived is one that every president and to some degree every American, every patriot has, has grappled with ever since. And that's why Jefferson is timeless and always, always uh, subject for a, good, for a good argument. The founders are, are held in very high esteem by uh, different political organizations and groups. I'm curious, uh, Jefferson was really a complex figure. I wonder what some of those groups would think if they knew that he owned and read the Koran and that as president he had spent the equivalent in today's dollars of, uh, let me get that figure here, $150,000 on wine for the White House during his presidency. Oh yeah. Again, the man of the people. Um, the foe of extravagance. Um, go figure. You know, well, but you all know, I mean, I'll bet most of us, to varying degrees, are more complicated. I mean, none of us can be, can be summed up in a phrase. Um, but Jefferson, here, here's, here's Jefferson, Jefferson's attitude toward religion, for example, is part of the ongoing argument, and indeed that of the founders generally. The word deist gets thrown around a lot, I think cavalierly. I mean, I think John Adams was not a deist. Um, Jefferson was a religion of one. Jefferson believed that one day Unitarianism would be the state religion. 
of the United States. His gift for prophecy failed him on that occasion. But remember what Jefferson did. Jefferson, you, you can buy, you can go online and buy the Jefferson Bible. This is so Jeffersonian. Jefferson decided he would take the Bible and he would cut all, all the parts offensive to him. Everything, everything that reeked of the miraculous, everything that couldn't be explained scientifically, and, and all the miracles. Get rid of the wine and, and the water and all of that, and Lazarus disappears. And, and what he's left with, the Jefferson Bible, which you can buy, uh, is a book of ethics by what he, he said was the most sublime teacher who ever lived. That's how he looked on Christ. Um, the notion of an afterlife was something that didn't fit into his scientific universe. Um, on the other hand, you know, there's such touching elements of this. When he was a young man, his best friend, Dabney Carr, um, they would, this was before Monticello was built, and they would study uh, their books under a great tree on the hillside of, of the little mountain, what was then called Tom's Mountain. And they made a pact, as young men will do, that whoever died first would be buried on the mountain by his survivor. And lo and behold, in one of the many tragedies that came into Jefferson's life, uh, his best friend died. I think he was still in his 20s. And he was the first to be buried in what is now the Jefferson graveyard uh, on the side of the hill. Of course, later on, Jefferson, who was, by all accounts, enormously happy and fulfilled in his marriage um, to Martha uh, Wales Skelton, herself a young widow. Um, they were only married 10 years, and she died in 1782. And before she died, she promised, she made him promise that he would never marry again. Um, now, if you want to trace the Sally Hemings story uh, to that um, poignant encounter, um, that's fine. But um, this was a man who lost you know, almost everything dear to him and, and yet retained his essential optimism about mankind and the human experiment, and, and the future. Um, and that's something very American, it seems to me. And, 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 and finally, this is a man, if you go to visit the graveyard today, you'll see he designed his own tombstone, as he designed his house, as he designed so much else, um, including, you could argue, much of the country we inhabit today. Um, and he, of course, he wrote his own epitaph. And he didn't see fit to include the fact that he had twice been elected president of the United States in the things worth remembering. Instead, um, he, was, uh, he wanted to be remembered for the fact that he was author of the Declaration of Independence, but even more, before that, author of the Virginia Statute of Religious Freedom. And then finally, that he was the founder of the University of Virginia. And all of those fit together. They all make sense. But it's very interesting that he left out the presidency. Um, it's only one of the unanswered sort of oddities about Jefferson. We're going to open it up to, uh, in just a moment, to your questions, so uh, be thinking about what you'd like to ask, Richard. But uh, I wanted to ask you about something. I know you're planning an upcoming trip, and I thought it'd be neat if you could share uh, some of your plans with well, folks. Oh, sure. You know, one of these days, we, we got to get, get you and, and others on, on board. We, I, um, 
do a couple, and some of you, have, I, I recognize, some of you have been on these before. Um, I do a couple trips a year, uh, which I lead, uh, for which, by the way, I'm not paid. This is not a, uh, you know, um, and it's just, I, I have the joy, um, and it is a joy, of uh, getting on a bus with 30 people, in the past a disproportionate number of them Kansans, um, and going off to visit things that you won't find on any other tour. Um, we're doing uh, Mr. Lincoln's War in June for the 150th anniversary of Gettysburg. We're doing 15 Civil War sites with a Lincoln theme in uh, Virginia and Maryland, Pennsylvania, the District of Columbia. And then it, we, we do this deluxe trip, which, which actually have been doing for 20 years. And we learn from all of our mistakes, and we've got this incredible five-star, you know, historic hotels, that's everything else. Uh, but uh, 11 presidents in nine days in New York, the Hudson Valley, uh, and New England, uh, winding up in Boston. And it's, 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 you know, it's great fun. It's, I suspect, the only trip uh, that I know that allows you to visit the gravesite of Chester A. Arthur, um, fighting the crowds all the time. <laughs> the same day, you can stand in the cottage where well, Ulysses Grant breathed his last, surrounded by banks of flowers, 130 years old. Um, and of course, Hyde Park and the Roosevelt sites. Um, we visit Kikit, the Rockefeller estate. Uh, we go up the, the Flume in New Hampshire and the Cog Railway up Mount Washington, which has been doing its thing since 1885 and New York and Boston and anyway it's uh, it's it's a great trip so if if you know any of you have any interest or want more information you can go online uh, it's all one word presidents and patriots tours dot it's just presidents and patriots dot com I stand corrected presidents and patriots dot com anyway but it would be great to get you on, on yeah, that'd One be the, fun. You know? I, I think I know what you're going to talk about. Yes, I am. Uh, as a special tribute to Richard Norton Smith, we would uh, make available this evening, and in fact, uh, it will be announced later on this week in email. Uh, sounds the sounds off. Oh, the sounds off? I'll have to yell really loud, won't I? <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, in honor of uh, Richard Norton Smith, we have some books here called Unlimited Partners, Our American Story. And they're signed by uh, Bob Dole, Elizabeth Dole, and Richard Norton Smith. Also was one of the writers of the book as well. And we're going to make that book available this evening and we will announce later on this week in an email to let people know that it's available. And part of that, if you would become uh, a friend of the Dole Institute of Politics. As you know, and we don't charge for any of our programs, and part of it is just by being friends of the Dole, but because these books are there, you've heard Richard Norton Smith, Richard Norton Smith, one of the principal writers of the book as well. So if you join uh, tonight, all this week, uh, Friends of the Dole at $100 level or above, you have a book that's signed by all three people as well. And if you have not read the book on limited partners, I want you to know it is really an interesting book, one that I think you will enjoy very much. And our developmental uh, coordinator uh, for our development, Clarissa Unger, will be in the back if you have any questions about Friends of the Dole and to see if you want to purchase one of those uh, memberships for Friends of the Dole this evening. So I will turn it back over to you and we'll start with the questions. Thanks. Uh we have a question, Alex. Yes, uh, given the situation with transportation and communication at that point in time, and 13 colonies, how are campaigns com uh, con uh, conducted? That's a great question. That is a good question. Yeah, it's, it's uh, first of all, there's nothing uniform. So for example, um, to this day, it's, it's almost impossible. For example, if you, if you ask me what was the popular vote, 
in 1796, say Adams and Jefferson? I couldn't really answer. Uh, the fact is that the states, some states had popular vote, and hardly uh, popular in the way that you and I would recognize that term. Most states, however, still elected their electors by state legislature. And so the element of popular participation was limited. For the most part, the campaigns were waged in the press, in intensely partisan, um, venom-spewing uh, instruments of, of, uh, of one or another party who, who made absolutely no claim to objectivity and would not have understood it uh, if anyone did. Uh, newspapers existed to advance the cause of one party, one candidate or another. And, and, and of course, Jefferson famously, as Secretary of State in the Washington administration, uh, hired a man named Philip Freneau, uh, an indifferent poet, but a brilliant polemicist, uh, to be a clerk, an interpreter at the State Department. The fact of the matter is, while he was drawing a public salary, uh, he was spending all of his time engaging in character assassination of the rest of the administration uh, in print, and very effectively, I might, I might add. And, and, it, and the funny, as far as we know, because people kept diaries, people, you know, uh, Washington never called Jefferson overtly on this. There are conversations where it's clear that Washington is aware of it, he's not happy about it, but you know, he's walking on eggshells. The last thing in the world he wants is to see either Jefferson or Hamilton stalk out um, in, in, in anger. Um, he, he's all about buying time. He wants to keep both of them in his cabinet as long as possible, if, if, even if it means offering himself up as, uh, as something of a punching bag. They have a question in the back. Yes, you would mentioned Jefferson's views on nullification. Do you see this as being in a direct line to Calhoun and later the Confederate uh, secession? Uh, unfortunately, I do in the sense that that's how they saw it. You know, it's impossible, you, you can't in a sense blame Jefferson for failing to anticipate how subsequent generations would exploit, you know, or use his words. Um, but there's no doubt that he provided some pretty sacred cover for people like Calhoun and, and those who agreed with Calhoun about the basic issue of nullification, which of course would recur uh, during Andrew Jackson's presidency. Jackson, who certainly considered himself a Jeffersonian, but was first and foremost a nationalist, and made it very clear that if anyone tried to nullify a law around him, uh, he was prepared to lead an army uh, into South Carolina and dredge it in blood. Uh, Jackson was a man who knew his own mind, and Lincoln subsequently uh, referred back to Jackson's example so we, we know on the other side of the argument, there's no doubt that later generations refer back to their predecessor. And I think it's not surprising that likewise, that's actually I, one reason why, as I said earlier, Jefferson went out of fashion for a long while in the late 19th and early 20th centuries because he, he became mixed up with uh, exactly that school of thought. Um, in line with your um, theme of, of Jefferson's self-contradictions, I might, might, I'd like to ask you to comment on his uh, views of the indigenous nations in this country. And I, I know he, I think he promoted the study of the languages, indigenous languages. Yeah. I think he, wasn't he a founder of the American Philosophical Society? And, yeah. um, but also a friend of mine who is a member of an indigenous nation told me that 
he, he told Lewis and Clark to annihilate anyone that resisted him, them. And um, also, what about the purchase of the Louisiana Territory as far as uh, any claims by indigenous nations? Sure. Um, you're absolutely right to put your finger on this as a classic example of on the one hand and on the other. Uh, intellectually, Jefferson had real interest in, and I would say respect for, uh, the Indian nations. He, uh, for example, rem remembered as a young man coming upon uh, an Indian ceremonial and listening spellbound. He didn't understand a word, but listening to the eloquence of the Indian chieftain. And it made an impression on him that never really left him. Uh, the one book that he wrote, Notes on Virginia, uh, includes uh, all sorts of uh, comments upon Native Americans that are certainly, for example, qualitatively more positive than his view of the slave in terms of what he thought each race was, was capable of. That said, you, you again, you run up against the, the, the dichotomy between the theoretical Jefferson and Jefferson the practitioner, the nationalist, the office holder, the American patriot, if you will, uh, the man who was willing to sacrifice his constitutional principles in the name of doubling the size of the nation with all that that portended. Um, the fact of the matter is, Jackson is pilloried as the man responsible for the Trail of Tears, but it's the, the first expropriation of Indian territory, um, the, the, the first death knell, if you will, that sounds for the notion of a separate Indian civilization uh, takes place while Jefferson is in the White House. Jefferson believed uh, very much in the assimilation of the Native American. He believed that's uh, where the future lay, and in that sense, in, in relative terms, uh, he was a relatively liberal, humane figure. He didn't want to eliminate the Indian. Uh, he, he didn't want to, you know, fill in the blank. He wanted, but he, in a sense, he, he did want to eliminate their culture. He wanted to give them a chance to become agrarians, which, remember, Jefferson said, are the chosen people of the earth. Okay, do we have other questions? Well, right here. Yes, uh, without putting you on the spot, uh, would you say that Jefferson would be pleased with how our country's done? I don't have the slightest idea. Um, I, I think Jefferson, and again, I don't mean to be dismissive. It's, it's, a, it's, um, it's an impossible question to answer. Uh, uh, you can speculate. Um, but I'm not sure historians should do that. Um, I think, put it this way, I'll rephrase it. I think Jefferson should be pleased. Um, and I think in many ways you could make the argument, if you're speculating, that he would be pleased. Um, the scientist in Jefferson would, would be fascinated by what we have learned. Um, the politician in Jefferson, I'm not so sure. He would be appalled by the size of government, um, by the cost of government. On the other hand, this is, again, and we go back to the, go back to the contradictions. This is the man who said um, that basically constitutions and, and indeed systems should be in effect, torn up every 20 years or so. That basically, and above all, who said that the dead should not imprison the living. That the earth is for the living. And what that tells me is, at least on that day, when he said that, Jefferson had a very liberal, small L view of allowing the future to take its own course and not 
trying to uh, hold it down, hold it back, um, force it into a, a channel uh, to his liking. So if, if that's the criteria, uh, I think he'd just be fascinated. Um, he, he, I'm sure he'd do much better with um, modern technology than I do. Uh, <laughs> I mean, all those screens and things, you know, that people talk into. Um, I, Jefferson would find a way to make it work. And, and he would see the value, and he'd see the connections. He'd want to know, how did we get from there to here? I mean, he had that kind of mind. So I think it would be a feast of, uh, of intellect if Jefferson were to come back today. But I'm not, I'm not sure he'd be happy when he looked at government. Professor Smith, I'd like your uh, thoughts on how important the ha Haiti slave rebellion, slave revolution, and uh, Toussaint Louverture War, uh, and their defeat of the French, uh, the Napoleon French army, and to the Louisiana Purchase. Well, this again gets to the notion: anyone who thinks of Jefferson as a kind of dreamy. Um, you know, above the fray, um, apolitical sort, uh, without a cynical or manipulative bone in his body, um, needs only look at what happened in Haiti. Uh, the fact of the matter is, the reason that we were able to buy Louisiana in 1803 is because Napoleon's war in the Caribbean uh, attempt to put down a slave rebellion um, was going very badly. Now, okay, there was no nightmare to Virginia slaveholders that could begin to compare with the possibility of a spontaneous slave uprising. And yet, Jefferson, for some would say selfish national interest, um, in effect, took a neutral position toward this. Um, and, and we benefited from it enormously when Napoleon decided, you know, he had enough on his plate uh, fighting the British in and around Europe that his hopes for a, a North American empire um, were uh, something he could do without. That's 1802. Once the rebellion succeeds, um, and Haiti becomes only the second republic in the Western Hemisphere after the United States. You'd think that we would recognize them as fellow republics. We didn't. Uh, Jefferson reverted to form, in a sense, political and otherwise. Uh, and in fact, Haiti would not be recognized until Lincoln recognized it in 1862. So Haiti became very much uh, a, a kind of a focus. On the one hand, Jefferson was perfectly willing to encourage the rebellion as long as it produced tangible benefits for the United States. Uh, and once that was realized, uh, he, was, he was not about to uh, uh, recognize or legitimize a slave rebellion for the obvious reason of the example that it would set um, among his own countrymen. And remember, Jefferson, unlike Washington, always referred to Virginia as his country. And that's the final, ultimate paradox. Because if there was ever a man of the world, a citizen of the world, at home in the scientific laboratory or the art gallery, um, you know, chasing uh, zoological specimens, Jefferson during the war got into, the, uh, got into this heated argument with his French counterpart, and he insisted that American creatures were bigger than those in Europe. <laughs> and um, 
one, oh, for example, that a reindeer, um, something about it, I think it was a reindeer was so big it couldn't, it couldn't cross under a moose's belly. Um, and so he sent a specimen, he sent a moose um, dead, needless to say. And unfortunately, all the hair fell out, and it was pretty disgusting by the time it, it reached the old world, and he apologized for that. But, uh, but he, never, he never withdrew his scientific argument. There, as in everything else, this man of the world was ultimately a patriot, and he set an example in the presidency that I think on balance is probably a healthy one, that when there is a conflict, between your deepest convictions, uh, your ideological certainties, um, and the long-range good of the country, uh, the country comes first, and you will be lionized eventually, and you might get your face on Mount Rushmore. We have time for one last question. Uh, I understand that Thomas Jefferson is credited as the author of the principle of the division of church and state, but uh, quite often I, when I hear that uh, uh, passage read, it indicates a difference from the way we, we are presented with that thought today. Rather, he was in favor of the, of the uh, government staying out of the business of the church as opposed to the way we see it today where government tells the church what they, where they can and cannot be. I, I, I'm not exactly sure where that came from. A letter to somebody, um, a church in Boston or somewhere while he was president, I think. No, it, it's, it is true that um, in, in Virginia, of course, there was an established church. The Anglican church was the established church, and everyone was expected to, to support the church. Whether they attended it or not, uh, they would help pay for it. And, and Jefferson's view was that, you know, this was, this was wrong. Um, and Jefferson's notion of religious freedom was, as you indicate, that quite frankly, everyone should be perfectly free to embrace any religion or no religion. But that government had absolutely no uh, justifiable role in determining that. It is the most personal of decisions, and it should be treated as such. And I, you know, it, and it was, and this was a radical view at the time. It, you can see why he uh, he thought it belonged on his tombstone. Richard, thanks for another delightful you evening. Bet. Appreciate Thank you. it very much. If you, if you missed our first program on Washington, we will be uh, at the Edwards campus tomorrow night doing Washington. So if you missed it or if you just can't get enough of Richard, come over to Edwards. <laughs> come over to Edwards at 7.30 tomorrow night and join us there. Thanks for coming out. Hope to see you Sunday afternoon.